Hello and welcome to this edition of Jamaica Magazine. I hope you are well rested and ready for the week ahead. I'm your host, Adrian Atkinson. Coming up in today's show. Without justice, there can't be any peace. And that is why the Ministry of Justice is taking justice to the people, to every nook and cranny. Find out how the Ministry of Justice is making this a reality later. As usual, we have a wonderful show packaged just for you. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Water is precious. So we encourage everyone to practice the four R's of water conservation. Always remember to reduce your use of water wherever possible. Replace water wasting devices with water savings devices. Reuse water wherever possible. And wherever leaks are found, please repair them and repair them quickly. Don't delay. Practice the four hours of water conservation today. Good day, I'm Stephen McHugh and this is your JIS News for Tuesday, April 11, 2023. 368 micro-enterprises across eight communities have been receiving support to bolster their businesses courtesy of the Integrated Community Development Project, ICDP2. The project, organized by the Jamaica Social Investment Fund, JASIF, included beneficiaries from Denham Town, August Town and Greenwich Town in Kingston and St. Andrew, Tread Light in Clarendon, as well as Mount Salem, Anchovy, Salt Spring, and Norwood in St. James. Twenty micro-entrepreneurs were recognized for their outstanding achievement under the project at a recent Enterprise Development Grant Award Ceremony. We should never underestimate the power of the MSME in Jamaica. Never. Let me tell you what it means. At the end of October 2021, there were 425,000 MSMEs operating in Jamaica. That's a lot of companies. This means that participants of this program are contributing towards Jamaica's economic growth and all productive MSMEs uh, are, are in the process of doing that. MSMEs generate opportunities for entrepreneurs, employment for expanding the private sector. We're happy to be a part of the support. The grants not only support the provision of equipment, the grants provide customer service training, market training, financial management training, legal training, business records. These are all the things that sustain your business. And when you look at the numbers, and we are today in the room, we have cycle one and cycle two of the program. But what's powerful to me is that in the eight communities, we have supported on average 45 micro enterprises per community. We thank you so much for really believing and not only believing, but taking a step further to investing in us. It gives us the push to further invest in ourselves. Over $70 million in grant support has been issued over two cycles of the ICDP2. The Integrated Community Development Project 2 is funded by the Government of Jamaica. The entrepreneurs were awarded in areas such as philanthropy, creativity and innovation, use of technology in business, and social media marketing. Awards were also presented for entrepreneurship, community service, resilience, and compliance with business regulations. Expo Jamaica is back to its usual full in-person format this year. It's the first to such staging since the COVID-19 outbreak in 2020. The 48th staging will be held at the National Arena and the National Indoor Sports Complex from April 27 to 30. Over 370 participants from across the world have so far registered for the event, which seeks to connect hundreds of local manufacturers and exporters with local and overseas markets. The event is being hosted by the Jamaica Manufacturers and Exporters Association, JMEA. At a recent JIS think tank, Portfolio Minister Aubin Hill says more than half of the registered participants are overseas buyer entities. We want to make sure Jamaica's export grows exponentially, our investments increase, and that we train with heart and others, um, Jamaican young people, to, to 
expand our labor market. Meanwhile, Expo Jamaica chairman Aswad Morgan says the consistent increase in exhibitors and patrons will serve to expand the participants' reach. We've gotten a significant support from the number of sponsors that have been associated with the show over the years. And we have continued to work as an expo organizing committee to create what we co consider to be the perfect platform. Businesses wishing to participate in Expo Jamaica have until April 27 to register at expojamaica.com.jm. For more information, call 876-922-8880 or visit the Instagram page at Expo Jamaica. The Bureau of Standards, Jamaica, BSJ, has embarked on a campaign aimed at increasing the importance of quality and standards among businesses. The public education campaign, which was launched recently, is being carried out under the theme Committed to Quality and Standards. Among the sectors being targeted over the next few months are food, construction and tourism. During this period, the BSJ will also launch new and revised standards that are focused on commodities such as rice, fuel and technology products, including solar panels. Industry Minister Senator Aubin Hill says the campaign is part of programs to boost operations among businesses while ensuring they conform to the highest industry standards. As we look across the economic landscape and recognize the need for Jamaican businesses to be competitive locally and internationally, the commitment to high quality and high standards must be endorsed and practiced by all stakeholders. In other news, the Ministry of Health and Wellness has completed its target of delivering maternal support to 100 mothers of newborns under its Start Right program. Under Phase 1 of the program, the remaining 40 mothers at the Spanish Town Hospital received their care packages recently. At the handover ceremony, State Minister Juliet Cuthbert Flynn said government is committed to reducing the country's maternal morbidity and infant mortality rates. And so this Start Right program is to provide uh, a starter kit in order to facilitate a safe and secure environment in the neonatal period. Now we do understand from time to time um, in, in Jamaica, a lot of um, our mothers may not have a crib to, to secure their baby. You may not have a cot. And so this snuggle nest that you see here will be the perfect perfect place to place your baby um, once you're doing chores in the house or even um, if you're going to be taking a nap. And finally, seven members of the judiciary were sworn into higher office for the Easter term by Governor General Sir Patrick Allen on Thursday. They will serve in the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court. Honorable Justice Kisok Lang has been appointed to act as Judge of the Court of Appeal from April 17 to July 31. His Honor Dale Staple will serve as acting puny judge with effect from April 12 until further orders. Meanwhile, Master Pamela Mason, Master Stephanie Orr, Her Honor Opal Smith, and Her Honor Tracy Ann Johnson have been appointed as acting puny judges for the period April 12 to July 31. In addition, Her Honor Luciana Jackson has been appointed acting master in chambers with effect from May 1 to July 31. Governor General Sir Patrick Allen congratulated the appointees and reminded them of the crucial role they play in preserving the nation's values and democratic principles. Our judiciary is the bedrock of our society. It is an institution that safeguards the rights and liberties of citizen, every citizen, regardless of race, creed, or social standing. So as custodians of the law, you are entrusted with the responsibility to ensure that justice is dispensed fairly, transparently, and equitably. Responding on behalf of the appointees, Justice Lang says there is a collective pledge to do their utmost to justify the trust and confidence reposed in them. It is indeed an enormous honor and a privilege to have been given the opportunity to act in our respective positions. We expect that by discharging our duties fairly and diligently in accordance with the oaths we have taken, we will continue to enrich the justice system and satisfy the reasonable expectation of the people we serve. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Stephen McHugh. Thanks for watching.
nutritious food, succulent dishes, superior workmanship, and excellent service. Jamaica is on the go. Let's grow what we eat and eat what we grow. Let's harness the indomitable spirit of our most valued resource, our people. Let's support our local businesses. After all, buying Jamaican means building Jamaica. The government is spending over $13 billion to ensure better access to justice for all Jamaicans. Let's see how much has been budgeted to do this important work in this fiscal year. Without justice, there can't be any peace. And that is why the Ministry of Justice is taking justice to the people, to every nook and cranny. The mandate to make Jamaica a law-abiding society Access to a fair and efficient justice system is clear. The vision of facilitating access to quality justice services is taking form. The Ministry of Finance has given us enough funds for us to continue the improvement of all the courts across Jamaica during the next fiscal year. The largest share of the ministry's $13.8 billion budget for day-to-day -day activities in the 2023-2024 fiscal year goes to the Justice Departments that interpret and administer the laws of the land. The remaining $3.2 billion will finance the executive functions of the ministry as it seeks to increase access to justice. $768.5 million will be spent on the Corporate Services Division, which deals with the administrative functions of the Ministry. The Executive Office, which provides oversight and general direction for the Ministry and the Legal Services Unit, will spend $439.1 million this fiscal year. This amount includes $150 million for the procurement of motor vehicles. $116.3 million is set aside for pre-investment planning activities for the judicial complexes in St. Anne, St. Catherine, St. James and Manchester. The cost for internal auditing services to the Ministry has been estimated at $67 million. In its quest for ease of access to justice, the Ministry will be spending $385 million on the maintenance and refurbishing of courthouses. The Alternative Dispute Resolution Program will spend $698.3 million on interventions to reduce the flow of offenders into the formal justice system. This is being done through justice centers, restorative justice programs, child diversion, and the Victim Services Division. If we can get quarreling, fighting people, settling their difference, it will prevent a lot of criminality, a lot of crimes. And we are now spending in excess of 400 million for legal aid fees. I would like to cut that in half and shift it back to people settling their conflicts. Speaking of legal aid, the cost to deliver this service to Jamaicans this fiscal year is estimated at $478.4 million. $78.6 million will go to supporting the justice sector professional development. For the fiscal year 2023-24, the Ministry has been allocated a capital budget of $108.7 million. Thanks to this, residents of Stony Hill will welcome the construction of a justice centre in their community. The $88.7 million project is expected to bring restorative justice, child diversion and mediation services to the people. Remaining funds of $20 million will go to the renovation and upgrading of the Clarendon Parish Court. It is projected that by 2024, Fire protection and safety systems will be purchased and installed. Likewise, information technology equipment, cabling and networking. The Ministry of Justice is doing everything in its powers to make sure that justice is delivered in a timely manner. Hi Jamaica, this is Pernell Charles Jr., your Minister of Agriculture and Fisheries. 
April is recognized as Farmers Month. And that's the time for us to celebrate our noble, hardworking and resilient farmers and fishers. Our food heroes have led Jamaica through some of the most difficult times. Whether it is pandemic, global conflict or climate change, you have continued to persist and exceed expectations. So we want to thank you for seven consecutive quarters of growth in the agricultural sector. And I show you that the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries will continue to give the necessary support so that you can continue to be the food heroes that you are. Farming is viable and food security is everybody's business. So, as we celebrate Farmers Month, we want to urge all Jamaicans to get on board and grow smart and eat smart. One love. Becoming environmentally friendly can be somewhat of an inconvenience at times. Paper straws are not as sturdy as the plastic ones. Neither are paper bags when compared to the plastic ones. But when we think about the harmful effects of plastic on the environment, it doesn't seem all that bad. That is why education is so important. And once you have the knowledge, it is important to put what you know into practice. Watch now to learn how we can make Jamaica Plastic free. Plastics. How did plastics become a crisis? It's an interesting issue if you really think about the history of what plastics are, what we use them for, how we consume them as individuals. The problem you have with plastics is that because of how good it is as a packaging material, because it is so light, so cheap, we have gotten away. We have overdone it. Everything is wrapped in plastic, even what doesn't need to be. The reality is 13% of Jamaica's waste is largely plastic, or is some form of plastic. Whether it's PET, HDP, PC, whichever other category of plastic it is. And we know that for the vast majority of this plastic, it is indeed plastic bottles. Why don't you just ban it? And people ask me that every single day. Just ban the plastic bottles. And quite frankly, you can't because the alternative is glass and globally there's a glass shortage. I don't know if there'll be some you know, global event that makes glass far more available and you know, cleaner ways will come to sterilize it. But as it stands now, that's not an option. So we have to target it through a deposit refund scheme. But there are items that we have banned. Persons largely will remember the scandal bag ban, styrofoam ban, plastic straws, and the reasons that these items are largely non-recyclable, they're non-biodegradable, and in many cases, because of how they're used, they emit carcinogens that are harmful to human health. We consume, especially with lunch boxes, a lot of gravy, a lot of heat. Heat and styrofoam not meant to mix um, in that sort of way for human consumption. Hence the challenge. Now, has the ban been perfect? No, there's no perfect um, public policy. Has the ban reduced by a few hundred thousand tons the amount of plastic waste going into our waste stream? Absolutely. Is that a win? Absolutely. Are we proud of it? Absolutely. Can we tweak it to make it better? Absolutely. We have seen persons who have gone right outside of the regulations on plastic bags. So they've gone a little thicker or a little larger trying to use plastic instead of paper-based and recyclable alternatives or reusable alternatives. That means we're going to have to move the goalpost. And that move will come this year. We're going to have to increase the size both in terms of dimensions and thickness and types of plastic bags that are banned. So for all of those who may be online now listening to us and contemplating their next round of purchases, I would suggest strongly to you that you look at the recycling alternatives because you will get stuck with goods and the minimum order quantities for these sorts of things, you will have months of goods put down. And that increase in size is coming and coming fast. 
we took out styrofoam or expanded polystyrene foam, as the appropriate term should be. The intention of the ban was not for you to switch styrofoam for plastic. It is the intention of the government to remove these plastic lunch containers from the waste stream by also expanding the ban to include them. Again, I would then suggest to those who import to do so with the minimum quantities because you don't want to get stuck with something that you'll only be able to recycle. And no, we will not be reimbursing for those because we're sending the signal clear. Our sewage plants and wastewater processing stations really can't manage these microplastics. There is no way for us to filter them out of the wastewater stream. We don't need them. They're deleterious to human health, deleterious to marine health. They can affect soil quality. They have to go. As a part of the expanded ban, we will include microplastics as a part of personal care products. Jamaica, the end of this financial year, will have a legislated deposit refund scheme. That system will have to work with customs, the NCRA, BSJ, NEPA, NSWMA, and indeed the Ministry of Industry in ensuring that the way we implement it is done seamlessly, causes no disruption to supply and, and pro, um, production, and it is done in a way where it does not trigger further inflation. So if you think of what that's trying to achieve, right? That is trying to deal with issues of collection, it's trying to deal with building out a circular economy. It's trying to get in many ways the public, the business community, to help us collect 13% of the waste and bring it along their, their routes of travel to points of collection to make it easier logistically for NSWMA. But it also will help us to reduce our carbon footprint. We're going to have to disaggregate all of the things that are classified as environmental management and we're going to have to accept that as a part of our economic development doctrine as a country, we are going to manage our environment with very strict regulations in a manner that is enforced and that gives confidence, but gives predictability. It cannot be haphazard. This is why I'm very happy that NEPA was able to report that 42 persons have been prosecuted. Now, we're going to go on a drive. I'm going to be working with the NCRA and indeed Customs and the JCF over the coming months, that number is going to increase significantly based on what we're seeing in, in, in society. And we're seeing it at the higher end of the economic scale and the lower end of the economic scale. And the, these strictures and, and penalties will be applied equally regardless of where persons are, are operating. You may have heard stories of grandmothers cautioning that manners are the resources to take you around the world. And cheekily, you would think that's not manners, that's a passport. Well, the grandmothers may not have been wrong, but neither are you. Let's look now at the procedure to acquire this world traveling document. Please, and thank you. It's among the world's most powerful books. It grants you access to over 50 international territories without a visa. I'm sure by now you realize I'm speaking of a Jamaican passport. Here's how you can acquire this trusted identification and a travel document. The Passport Immigration and Citizenship Agency, PICA, is the government entity responsible for issuing this identification and citizenship document. First, you must obtain and complete a passport application form. The form is available at PICA offices on their website or any police headquarter island-wide. First-time adult applicants are required to appear in person with their completed application form and two identical photographs, one of which must be certified by the person who verified the application form. The photos must be taken within the last six months for it to be valid. Additional documents are a birth, 
adoption or Jamaican citizenship certificate, as well as a valid government-issued photo identification, such as a driver's license or a voter's ID, and a proof of name change if the name has been altered. For renewals, adult applicants may apply online or in person by submitting a simplified renewal form along with the expired passport. A Dropbox service is also available at Pika's headquarters at 25 Constant Spring Road in Kingston. Applications submitted using the Dropbox service will take seven working days to process. Applicants living overseas must visit pika.gov.jm to start the renewal process. They will need their expired passport, passport-sized photograph or upload, Visa or MasterCard, debit or credit card to make payment, and an email address to get updates on the application. Applicants who are under 18 years old must appear in person and present a certificate of citizenship, two identical photographs with one being certified, the parent or legal guardian's government-issued identification, and sections C and E of the application completed by the parent or guardian. The same procedure applies for passport renewals for minors. Passport processing fees will vary depending on the service chosen or the location where the application was submitted. A regular adult passport costs 6,500 Jamaican dollars locally, 80 US dollars if in America, or 50 pounds in the United Kingdom. Pika's Kingston location processes applications in seven working days. Montego Bay, Portmore, and Maypen does so in 14 days, while overseas applications take 20 working days. Expedited services are also available for local applications. Once the passport is ready, applicants must bring the official receipt with a valid ID and pick up at the location they submitted their application. The person collecting on an applicant's behalf must have a written consent form, a copy of the applicant's ID and the official receipt. Courier services are available at Pika's Kingston location. It's the gateway to travel and so much more. Getting a passport is your legal right as a Jamaican citizen. Walk right over there and drop it in the bin. Reuse that wastewater from your kitchen for the garden. Get your hands dirty and plant a tree. Farmers, hold off on the pesticides, especially near our rivers. Do your part to protect our watersheds so we can preserve the source of our drinking water. Every act to protect our watersheds counts. Start now. We've come to the end of another magazine program, and I do hope you had a wonderful time. Should you want a recap of today's show or other programs, please visit our website, gis.gov.jm. Until next time, I'm Adrian Atkinson. Do take care. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica. Jamaica.